a Sunday night edition of the Air Tour Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Air Torres. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody is having a great day. By the way, congrats to my little sister. Um, listen, it's not about me, even though my name's on the show. I just became an uncle moments ago. Was ready to go on air. Heard my phone ringing. Uh, my little sister just gave birth to a baby boy. So congrats to my little sister. I won't drop her name, won't drop anybody else's name. Uh, but it is a special day for me. But more importantly, people, it is a special day for Big Blue Nation. We have so much to talk about here on today's Aaron Torres pod. We did a reaction on Friday to Mark Pope emerging as the head coach of the University of Kentucky. I think by Friday, everyone had kind of wrapped their arms around it. Well, I told you, I said, wait until, wait until that opening presser. I think he is going to blow you away. And when I say that was a top one all-time press conference, I'm here to tell you that was maybe the most electric press conference that I have ever heard or seen. So everybody come on in, drop your questions, drop your comments in the uh, in the chat there. We are so excited to be live here on a Sunday night. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to react to just an electric press conference. We're going to react to everything Mark Pope said, everything that he did, um, and why I just think he is the perfect guy at the perfect moment for the University of Kentucky. From there, we will then talk about what his first steps are. I mean, this is his first official day on the job. I have a feeling he's not going out for a bottle of wine with his wife and, and, and his kids. I think he's going to get to work. I think he's going to get to work re-recruiting this roster. I think he's going to get to work uh, working the portal, of course, maybe potentially bringing in a former player or two of his. So we'll talk about the press conference. We'll talk about what his work is now. And then we'll also talk about a few other things. One, I do just want to quickly touch on the UConn championship parade. Probably spend two or three minutes on it because I thought there were two or three interesting elements that came out of that. And then we have to talk about the College Hoops transfer portal. It went crazy this weekend. Visits, commitments, players entering, and more. So as always, drop your questions. We will get to them. Obviously, Super Chats. Uh, if you drop a Super Chat, that will become priority. But everybody, come on in. We appreciate your support here on a Sunday night. We had over 100 people in the queue before we got started. We have 255 people watching now with many more to come. And so with that said, let's not waste any more time and let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, it's amazing what a week, a difference, what a difference a week can make in the world of life and college sports and whatever. A week ago, I think it was right around, I'm recording here about 7 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. The first little whispers of John Calipari going to Arkansas we did the live two-hour reaction once it became official. Don't even think we went on air until about 10 p.m. Eastern time. But that settles down. Cal's at Arkansas, and Kentucky is searching for a new head coach. And so where we last left off, listen, Thursday night, it was a little chaotic. I think there was some frustration with uh, Kentucky fans about the initial hire of Mark Pope. But when I came on air Friday afternoon, it felt like everybody kind of had done their homework. Everybody kind of understood what he would bring to the table. And let me just say this. I get a lot of stuff wrong. But producer Matt, why don't you go ahead and pop up the tweet that I put up on Thursday night when Big Blue Nation was in a little bit of a uh, panic about the Mark Popeye. I tweeted out this was Thursday night at what? Uh, 8.57 p.m. I want to say that, you know, I think I assume that was Eastern time, whatever. I said, all I ask Kentucky fans, give Mark Pope till the opening press conference. He's super dynamic, and he wanted a place that's basically impossible in the modern era, and he clearly knows Kentucky's expectations. Give him a chance. He'll be impressed, and it's on him once the season starts. So that was what I put out Thursday. Producer Matt, why don't you play the clip, what I said on Friday's show? He understands what it's about. You know, it's funny, right? Like, me being a UConn guy, like, like I get how UConn fans are. I know how they're going to react to certain things. And I have no doubt that he knew what the reaction was going to be. And I don't think it scared him. I don't think intimidated. And as a matter of fact, I think he probably chuckled at it. I think he probably laughed at it, thought it was funny and had a good time. And so that's the first thing you need to know about Mark Pope. And the one thing I did say, 
Because I, I, as I said, I didn't love the process of how we got to Mark Pope, but I don't hate the hire. And the one thing I will say about Mark Pope, I, I did say on Thursday night, I said, Kentucky fans, just give it to the opening press conference. He's having the opening press conference at Rupp Arena. My understanding is fans will be allowed to come in. I think he is going to make you laugh. He's going to make you cry. He's going he's gonna to make you do everything. That's the kind of personality he has. The only way I can describe him, frankly, is with the word that your old coach used to use all the time. I think he's a really swaggy dude. He walks in. He's confident. He's confident in who he is. He's confident in what he's about. Well, that was Torres on Friday afternoon. We have now got in the first part of the Mark Pope experience. And let me just ask you, Big Blue Nation, listen, I understand that until he coaches a game, that frankly, until he gets to a Final Four, wins a national championship, those are the way. Those are the ways that you are going to determine if he is the right coach for Kentucky or if he can live up to the standard of all of the people, most of the people that have come before him. But I will also say this, my old radio partner, Arnie Spanier, he always used to say, Torres, the show is tonight. And what that means is we can only base our opinion on the facts that we have right now. And I'm here to tell you, for an opening press conference, I don't think anyone could have handled it any better than Mark Pope did on Sunday afternoon at Rupp Arena. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, is there a lot to react to from Sunday. First off, let me start by saying this. Big Blue Nation, shout out to you. I'm talking about you and you and you and you and you and you and you, okay? Because at the end of the day, here is the bottom line. The bottom line is, you know, listen, there, there, there is there, there are some negative connotations to Kentucky fans. They're too passionate. They care too much. This, that, the other thing. Sunday showed the best. By the way, I don't mind it. It's part of my, you know, it's what has helped me get my career to where it is right now, okay? But at the same time, I bring it up to very simply say, all of the things that people talk about as negatives, the passion, the fandom, the excitement, I thought the best versions of it were on display on Sunday at Rupp Arena. You know, we'll get a final ticket total, a ticket tally, but there had to be 15,000 people there. It looked like a sellout. You guys got more fans in the stands than probably 99% of people will get for a regular season basketball game next year. You got it for an introductory press conference. And so that is why this will always be the premier program in college basketball, the premier job in college basketball. And it is why Mark Pope so desired. So with that said, now let's switch gears to the Mark Pope side of things. And all I can say is this guy knocked it out of the park. On our Torres on Kentucky account, our Torres on UK account, you can see it down below. Our Torres on UK account asked a very important question after the press conference. How would you grade Mark Pope's introductory press conference? Would you grade it in A+. plus? The options were as follows. A+, plus, A++, plus plus. A plus 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 plus, or you fainted midway through because that's how good this thing was. Okay. And so, first of all, the entrance said it all a bus full of former Kentucky players. Everybody's getting off the bus, this and that. It ends with the 1996 national championship team. And there comes Mark Pope out with the trophy. There comes Mark Pope out to the adoring fans. And I think even just the introduction made him get it. May, may, proves that he gets it. Proves that he understands what this job is about, what it's about. And I do think that he is a link to the era before John Calipari, okay? And to be clear, I don't think that the fact that he only played at University of Kentucky makes him a candidate. I get it. I get all this. I get all that, okay? Okay. But I bring it up because, in my opinion, one of the big things that you cannot argue about with Mark Pope, we're going to figure it out at a certain point. Is he built for this job? We're going to find out when he plays the Kansases and the Dukes and the Louisvilles and the whoevers. But does he get the responsibilities of this job? Absolutely, as he walks out with the 1996 National Championship trophy. On top of that, let me say this. I think he hit on every single 
major talking point that any Kentucky fan would want to hear in that press conference. I mean, he just nailed everything. And I'll be honest, I don't know if Mitch, I, I, one of two things happened. Either Mark Pope has been following this program very closely from a distance, like very closely, maybe a, a subscriber to some of the message boards. I think Mitch Barnhart may have prepped him on what to say and how to say it because he hit on not only every point a Kentucky fan would want to hear, if you paid very close attention. All of the things that got frustrating by the end of the Calipari era, Mark Pope did a pretty good job of making sure to mention those things as well. So first of all, I love the introductory moment where he says, there's been a lot of press conferences, but there's never been anything quite like this. Love that. Love the fact that he started by saying, guys and girls here in Rupp Arena, guys and girls here across the state, I understand the assignment. It is to bring in banners into this arena. But then did you see what he said right after that? He said it starts in Nashville at the SEC tournament. And you really either have to be a diehard Kentucky fan, maybe a diehard Torres fan, because we talked about this after Kentucky lost in the SEC tournament to Texas A&M. You can go back to the beginning of the John Calipari era. And at the beginning of the John Calipari era, he basically, one of the first kind of screw ups that he made basically as the Kentucky head coach was he basically insinuated early on, I don't really care all that much about this SEC tournament. It has nothing to do with whether we're going to win the national championship in any given year or not. And even from the beginning, that frustrated Kentucky fans because Kentucky fans said, wait a second now, this is our event. We pack probably 90% of the arena in most years, maybe even more, depending on if Tennessee is good or not. But two, we spent our whole year planning for this. We spent our hard-earned money on a trip to Nashville. And the way I explain it to people all the time, and I know you know Kentucky fans, but at the same time, with Kentucky, the bottom line is there's a lot of people that can't get tickets to Rupp Arena on any given night. There are people that don't know where Kentucky is going to play in the NCAA tournament. And so planning a trip on one week's notice is not realistic. But they plan their whole year. They take vacation time around the SEC tournament. And I will say, I'm a Calipari supporter, but I always thought this was a thing that he did not handle well from the beginning, is understanding the importance of this tournament. And I was critical after you lose to Texas A&M. I said, you, you had thousands of fans come all the way out to Nashville and you put out that kind of performance, that's unacceptable. So that was the first thing that Mark Pope said that caught my attention as far as how he's going to run this program, how it's going to be different. There will be a pride in not just national championships, but SEC championships as well. Two, the scheduling comment was very interesting in my opinion, okay? So for people who missed the scheduling comment, Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio. By the way, I had a, a listener of the show tell me, uh, every time I hear producer Matt, I think of Matt Jones. No, Matt Jones is not the producer of this show. He's got a, a lot on his plate already, um, and, and that is not one of his responsibilities, okay? But Matt Jones asked the question, because Matt Jones for years has been basically saying, can we get one trip to the Maui Invitational? Just one time, I just want to go to Maui to cover my team. And so on Sunday, Mark Pope by Matt Jones was asked about the scheduling. And he first said, hey, guys, girls, what do you think about a game against St. John's? And he kind of said it, but then he kind of took it back right away. Remember, Mark Pope, of course, played for Rick Pitino, and he took a moment to just say, you know what? Thanks to Coach P. Thanks for everything that he did to get me to this point. But he insinuated maybe there's a home and home involved with St. John's. Maybe there's a neutral court game or, or a road game with St. John's at Madison Square Garden. My assumption would be uh, if you're going to Madison Square Garden, then you are doing a return game at Rupp Arena. So I thought that was interesting. But then he did say, he's like, listen, I don't even know if I have Mitch Barnhart's approval saying this, but I think we could sneak into that Maui tournament once or twice. So that was something that, again, felt like a subtle little jab at the previous administration. And then finally, I thought he just hit on a lot of the other stuff, which was um, the bottom line was like he talked a lot about 
you know, how he's going to put a staff together. The fact that there's going to be new roles that might not have previously existed in other iterations of college basketball. He talked about recruiting. He said, we're going to get some burger boys, some McDonald's all Americans, but we're also going to bring in some players that can grow and develop and be part of this program for years to come players that you can wrap your arms around and get really excited about. And so I thought that was interesting as well. Again, what felt like another subtle jab at John Calipari. And so listen, I I don't want to make this all about Cal, but my biggest picture takeaway from the entire press conference, I just think it's, it's going to be best for everyone that John Calipari made the move that he did. Because at the end of the day, when I look back to that statement John Calipari made last Tuesday, what did he say? He said, this program needs a new voice. This fan base needs a new voice. This school needs a new voice. And I'll be honest, I think he was actually right. Obviously, if Arkansas doesn't come through with an incredible offer and an incredible opportunity, and this isn't bash Calipari day, okay? I think he is going to do well at Arkansas. I think he's going to be rejuvenated at Arkansas. But it was clear that this program did need a fresh voice. And it was clear that this program did need somebody else leading the charge. And you just could see in the crowd the energy, the excitement. I think the 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 drawback to another era of Kentucky basketball. The last 15 years was incredible. But at certain points, did it get too much about the one and done? Did it get too much about NBA players? Did it get too much about kids that are going to come in for a year, leave after a year, and have no affiliation with the school afterwards? Yeah, it probably did. And there is a big percentage of the fan base that I think wants, I I would guess, virtually all of the fan base, if not all of the fan base, wants to go back to an era where it is about more about the, uh, the, the name on the front of the jersey and the name on the back, all those cliche things bringing in more Kentucky kids, not everybody having to be a one and done, not everybody having to be a five-star, building a program that involves, yes, an elite prospect or two, but also at the same time, guys that are redshirting, guys that are developing, guys that are playing in the portal, this and that, da 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 whatever. And so I just think that this is the fresh start that Kentucky needed. You could feel the energy. The fans just drop something. Give me a second here. Give me a second here. We'll edit all this out. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Give me a second here. But I'm back. You could feel the energy of the fans. You could feel the excitement. You could just feel the freshness. Mark Pope cracking jokes. Mark Pope cracking jokes about his 96 national championship team, how they're going to be tougher on him than any fan ever could be. Mark Pope smiling. Mark Pope with his family. Listen, man, you know, when I wrote my book on Kentucky basketball, you know, I went back and watched that John Calipari presser. When he brings in Ellen, when Brad, who is now one of his assistant coaches at Arkansas, was six, was what, probably 12 years old, 13 years old. And it comes full circle. And you know what? It is time for somebody new. It is time for a fresh voice at Kentucky. Go ahead and make sure to drop the, uh, go ahead and make sure to drop your questions in the chat. We are going to get to uh, Mark Pope here momentarily, and we're going to get to what his first moves are going to be. Before we get to it, though, producer Matt, listen, we we slave away here at Aaron Torres Media. We slave away um, at uh, at Aaron Torres Media to get you the coolest, hippest stuff ever. Why do I bring it up? It's because when I saw the group of fans forming at probably 10 or 11 a.m., if not earlier at Rupp Arena, I said, we need some new merch in the Aaron Torres Media store. And so I present you, for the first time, our new Mark Pope gear in the Aaron Torres store. Bruce and Matt, pop it up. That's right. We have hope in Pope. Credit to my my design guy. He turned this around really quick. It is a great shirt. We are starting to sell them. Uh, There is a link in the show description. There will be a link. You can see the link. I believe producer Matt just dropped a link into the chat. Make sure, make sure to grab one of yours. We are literally going into production tonight. So grab yours, hope and Pope. Listen, everybody, I'll say this. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and beg. Okay. 
Everybody always asks me, Taurus, how can I help? How, how can I help this show? You give us thousands of hours of free content every single year. What can I do to help? You want to help? Grab one of these bad boys. Support us. Bluntly, you know, we don't make very much money off merch. By the time you buy the shirt, by the time you ship it, by the time you pay the printer, by the time you pay the designer, it's not that much. But you want to help out Taurus just a little bit. Link is in the show description. Link is in the uh, feed. And the Hope in Pope jersey, the Hope in Pope tees have arrived. We have just already gotten our first order. I won't drop a name because I don't want to be uh, disrespectful of anybody else that may order them. But we just got our first couple orders. Thank you for your support. You know what, people? We have Hope in Pope. And here is the good news. The second anything, any anytime he does anything good, I will remind you of these. These are now available in the Aaron Torres merch store. But that said, do want to switch gears and want to stay on Mark Pope. I want to stay on Kentucky, but I want to talk now. Okay, the press conference is over, right? It's a, That was the moment. That was the moment in time. By the way, Producer Matt is a 1,000% right. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to do so because guess what? We're going to have so much content coming out as this guy fills out his roster, recruits for next year's class, for the 2025 class, whatever. Make sure you're subscribed. Also, find us on social media, the, the Torres on UK Twitter account and Aaron Torres pod on Instagram. So we appreciate your support. And now the press conference is done. We all have hope in Mark Pope. And so now the question becomes, what is Mark Pope's first moves as Kentucky basketball coach, right? Because, and I got a lot of this throughout the course of the week or the weekend, like anything else. Anytime I said anything nice about Mark Pope, what becomes the question? Well, it's all well and good right now, Torres, but we have to wait and see until November. We got to see him win games. They open the season or early in the season, they play Duke in the champions classic. Gonzaga's on the schedule. I believe Indiana's on the schedule next year. And so what does Mark Pope have to do to build a team that is good enough to win and win big and win early as the head coach of the University of Kentucky? Well, first off, and I said this on uh, I said this on Monday uh, on on Friday's show. What I said was for most coaches, you're taking over a bad situation and you're taking over a situation where the roster is gutted, where you got to start over, where you got to frankly kind of force some kids out. Mark Pope has a very unique and advantageous situation because you can blame John Calipari for whatever. But the one thing you cannot say, first of all, the team was good last year. It didn't end well against Oakland, but the team was good. The team was a three seed in the NCAA tournament. The team finished second in the toughest SEC in the history of the SEC. And there is still talent in that room. And I believe the first order of business for Mark Pope, boy, oh boy, oh boy, forget hitting the portal. Forget going on the road to recruit. You know what your first job is? Meet with anybody left on campus and do what you have to do. Use that charm that you just used in that opening press conference. Use that charm to convince some guys to stay. Because here's the bottom line. There is a core in that on that campus right now, finishing up classes over the next couple of weeks, that is good enough. And if you can retain it, you can be really good right away. Now, admittedly, Rob Dillingham has declared he's not coming back. Justin Edwards has declared he's not coming back. Now, it's worth noting, since our Friday show, Big Z has hit the portal. Aaron Bradshaw and Adu Thiero were in the portal. So one, hopefully those guys are still on campus. Hopefully you have a conversation with them. But where it starts, bluntly, we already know. It's with the guy who uh, is with the player whose dad is Mark Pope's old roommate. Okay, that sounds like the uh, the guy on the message board that knows a guy that knows a guy that knows the male guy who knows Mark Pope. No, no, no. We're talking, of course, about Reed Shepard, whose father, Jeff Shepard, was Mark Pope's roommate at Kentucky and where uh, Mark Pope did not unintentionally slip when he said, my job is to shepherd along the young men in this program. And so for Mark Pope, listen, Mark Pope has known Jeff Shepard for 25 years, okay? Mark Pope is not going to beg, probably closer to 30 now that I think about it, Mark Pope's not going to beg Reed Shepard to come back to Kentucky if 
that is not what Reed Shepard wants, or if Reed Shepard truly is ready and truly feels like he is ready to become a pro. But at the same time, let me also say this. I've argued it, and people have come at me, people have disagreed, people have whatever, people have this, people have that. I have, I have been steadfast in my belief. I think there's a strong possibility that Reed Shepard couldn't come back for a sophomore year at Kentucky. And I believe it might be even more likely right now than it was when the season ended. Because if you come back now, if you came back under Calipari, now it's the burden of, oh my goodness, I got to do this for Coach Cal. We got to save his job, blah, 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 this and that. But now it's a much more positive thing of we get to start a whole new generation. The way that, by the way, Jeff Shepard did in 1997-98 when Rick Pitino left and Tubby Smith took over. I get to be part of this. I get to be the face of this. I get to be the first chapter of the, or I get to be the first page of the newest chapter of Kentucky basketball. And so that's the pitch from Mark Pope to Jeff uh, Shepard to Reed Shepard. And I keep going back to what I've said about Reed Shepard from the beginning. One. I respect his basketball skill. I don't know if he's a top five pick, but what I will say, I keep going back to this. I know you can't compare a four-year NBA rookie contract to NIL money, but I do think that Reed Shepard is uniquely built to make a crap ton of money as a Kentucky basketball player next year in a way that he won't in the NBA. Now, again, you compare one year of NIL to a four-year contract, I get that it's different. But at the same time, just think about it, okay? Reed Shepard as a Kentucky basketball player. First of all, we know that over $4 million was committed to NIL on the first day of the job for Mark Pope. So the collective is humming. The collective is ready to write checks. And you'd think Reed Shepard would get the biggest one if he returns. But beyond that, think about all those little local endorsements. I don't want to say little. That does I, that didn't. If it sounded condescending, I apologize. That wasn't the intention. But think about all those local endorsements that he is going to get as a Kentucky basketball player. He had a million this year. Now he comes back playing for a former Wildcat who was his father's roommate. Guy's going to make so much money, he's not going to know what to do with it. And I go back to what I've said from the beginning. Reed Shepard is uniquely built in the NIL era to make so much money that he won't make as a pro. I'm telling you, if he's the eighth pick of the Portland Trailblazers, or the seventh pick of the Charlotte Hornets, and I don't know who's supposed to pick where. He's not going to make the same money that he will as the star of the Kentucky Wildcats. And so, again, I don't think Mark Pope is ever going to force him to do something that he doesn't want to do. I know Mark Pope's not going to. And by the way, Jeff Shepard's not going to let his buddy do that to his son. But that's my first recruiting pitch is, bro, I saw your father stay here in 98 and change the trajectory of this program forever. I saw him make history, win a national championship, become a legend, you can come do the same. And so I will be curious if he can convince Reed Shepard to stay. I'll be honest. I'll be curious to see if he can convince DJ Wagner to stay. As of right now, unless I miss something, DJ Wagner is not in the portal. DJ Wagner is not has not entered the NBA draft. And you look at DJ Wagner, he's a very talented player. You put him in that Mark Pope system. You put the ball in his hands. First of all, I thought DJ Wagner was very good as a freshman this year. Nine points, three or 10 points, three and a half assists per game. Faded at at various points, had injuries at various points. Dude, not everything's a sprint. Not everything you have to get to the NBA. You come back as a sophomore in that Mark Pope system. Whoa, buddy. I think you have a chance to be an all-conference, if not an all-American type player. Now, again, if you get some sort of NBA draft feedback that says, hey, you're going to be a first-round pick, a top-15 pick, I think it's different. I think you should consider it. But if DJ Wagner can come back for another season at Kentucky, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me as to what DJ Wagner could do in that Mark Pope system, which he talked about, a lot of three-pointers, a lot of spacing, a lot of ball movement? I think he could be a star. On top of it, I think the big guys are very interesting. Now, Big Z, we're going to talk a we're going to do a portal update in a minute. Big Z, listen, I, I'm not here to say what's going to happen or what could happen or what should happen or what might happen. I do think there is a possibility, though, that Big Z, um, I do think there is a possibility that Big Z 
is gone for good. Okay. I'm not here to, to uh, whatever, but you look at big Z, you look at the fact that, um, you know, Calipari brought him over. Calipari went to bat for him. Now credit Kentucky fans. They bought the billboard. They put pressure on the NCAA, but if you can somehow convince big Z, listen, we know you're loyal to Calipari. We get it. We understand everything that he did for you, but this is no longer about loyalty. It's a business decision. And we have the perfect system for you, Big Z, to highlight your talents. I think Aaron Bradshaw would be perfect in the Kentucky or in the new Kentucky system under Mark Pope. Spacing, ball movement, three point shooting. Aaron Bradshaw, you want to prove as a seven foot one center that you have an NBA level game? Come back to Kentucky and go ahead and prove it. So I'll be curious what players can be retained from last year. I'll also be curious what recruits can be retained from last year. First off, I'm sure if you were watching, you saw Travis Perry, the Kentucky High School Player of the Year, was in attendance, wearing a Kentucky shirt. Um, I, I, listen, I've been told that I, I think Calipari kind of offered him because he felt like he had to. Travis Perry is not following John Calipari to Kentucky. And it sounds like he's going to stay. Mark Pope even said, yeah, that doesn't strike me as a kid who's going to enter the transfer portal. So I would expect Travis Perry to be there. He's a bucket. Excited to see him in that UK uniform. But then is there anybody else that was committed that you can convince to stay? Boogie Fland, unless I miss something, has not officially asked out of his letter of intent. Not saying he won't. Not saying uh, uh, Arkansas might not be the spot for him. But Boogie Fland, this system is built on guards, built on talent. Come here. You can be a one and done. You can be a superstar. This system is going to get you buckets. It's going to get you open shots. It's going to get you three pointers. Come on, Boogie Flan. Is this what you want to do? Jaden Quaintance has asked out of his letter of intent. We'll be curious. There was a report early on that Jaden Quaintance would be willing to meet with the Kentucky administration following the coaching change. Will he stay? Is it under consideration? I know he asked out of his letter of intent. But is it a done deal he's going to Kentucky? That would be a huge one because that's a kid you get two years out of him. We've talked about it a lot from the Arkansas perspective if he goes to Arkansas. But if he goes to wherever he goes to college, he's only 16 years old. He will have to play two years of college basketball before he's NBA eligible, NBA draft eligible. Unless, of course, somehow, some way, you can convince him uh, or, you know, he could go overseas or whatever. But Jaden Quayans, Billy Richmond has not asked out of his letter of intent. Can you keep him at Kentucky? Does keeping DJ Wagner help get, get, get you Billy Richmond, who of course was DJ Wagner's high school teammate? And then of course, Carter Knox. Listen, I think Carter Knox is probably gone. He did have the chicken man in his, in his uh, Instagram profile the other day. I have not seen if that has been taken down or not, but I, I listen, I think a lot of those guys are in play. So it's about retaining the current roster. It's about looking at that recruiting class. It's also about looking at your former roster at BYU. Two players have already hit the portal from your BYU team. Be curious to see if you can get either of them. Obviously, Dallin Hall was the first one immediately after uh, Mark Pope left for the job. Dallin Hall, sophomore, averaged nine points per game, was a very good three-point shooter in the Big 12 averaged uh shot about 36 percent from the three-point line he's from utah he's entered the portal five and a half assists per game he's a dude passing spacing ball movement you could get five assists per game nine points 36 percent three-point shooting in the big 12 you can do it in the sec as well jackson robinson declared for the draft he was byu's leading scorer we'll be curious to see if you can get him back good four-year college player nba upside actually played at two different places in the sec was at texas a&m early redshirted there i believe then ended up at arkansas for a year found a home at byu though would be curious if you can get him to our uh to kentucky and then the other one this guy if you can convince him to come ali khalifa is the name He's a backup center. Listen, I'm not saying he's going to be the star of your team. Not saying he's going to be the star of your team, but he's a seven-foot center from Egypt who does one thing and one thing only. The dude drops dimes, okay? So this kid in about, what, 14, 15 minutes of play averaged four assists per game this year as a center in Mark Pope's system. 
I believe the terminology the kids use. This kid is an electric factory, okay? This kid is an electric factory. He is awesome. He's gifted. He's a great passer. Listen, I, I don't think he's good enough to play 37 minutes in the SEC. But that's a kid that understands the Pope system. He's in the portal. It's already been reported that he's down to three schools, a return to BYU, Louisville, and Kentucky. I'll be blunt. I don't know how you could sit there and say that he's returning to BYU if he doesn't even know who the coach is. So I think that kid probably ends up at Kentucky. And then lastly, for the Mark Pope checklist, listen, it is going to come down to staff, right? It is going to come down to who you bring in um, in a lot of different roles. It's not just, um, it's not just you know, uh, uh, you and it's not just players. But I do think, obviously, look, having, you know, a, a group of guys, having people that understand the recruiting space. I, I Listen, we talked about this on Friday's show. You didn't recruit those elite of elite guys. And there was a reason you didn't at BYU. We already talked about the honor code, and it's no disrespect to any religion, whatever. But you can't go to a five. It, it's hard to go to a five star one and done and say, come to BYU. where you can't drink alcohol can't drink caffeine, can't hang out with females, uh, you know, at, at all, basically, unless they're your wives. And so you do, I think, need to update the staff and you probably need to bring in a few guys who kind of understand the recruiting model in the new era of college basketball. And, um, and I'll be curious. I, I think you're gonna be really good. By the way, he mentioned in the press conference, the possibility of bringing in a GM obviously to handle a lot of the NIL stuff, a lot of the portal stuff. So this is going to be a new age operation. I'm going to be fascinated by the way, see him put his, his roster together. A couple returnees, maybe from the Kentucky side, a couple of uh, maybe five stars that Calipari can't quite convince to come to Arkansas. Certainly a couple players from BYU. And Oh, by the way, a couple players outside of BYU in the portal. Thought it was interesting when Mitch Barnhart was on Kentucky sports radio a few days ago, Mitch Barnhart mentioned, Hey, Mark Pope has told me there were some guys that he called at BYU that would not take his call that all of a sudden are now hitting him back that he's the Kentucky coach. The big name that popped over the course of uh, of Sunday, I think it was Joe Tipton who was the first one to have it, Amari Williams, seven-foot center, uh, who played the last four years at Drexel, was the two-time defensive player of the year in his conference, averaged close to two blocks per game this year. Averaged 2.2 blocks per game last year. This kid's an athlete, dude. Six foot ten, gets up and down the floor. Not a great three point shooter. So you wonder how much you know how that would work in Mark Pope's system. But you talk about a rim protector. You talk about a game changer, Amari Williams as well. But this is going to be fun, and I can't wait to see Mark Pope get to work. Really quickly, I do want to get to some of the other portal notes from the weekend. Um, but before we do, producer Matt, you want to knock on a knock out a question or two while we're here? Uh, a couple questions while we're here. Let's see what we got here. Give me a second. Give producer Matt a second here. He's he's having you know he's got to funnel through a lot of stuff here. Question: How soon do you do Mitch will arrange a St. John's versus UK game? Well, the only thing I will say about a St. John's versus UK game is that, um, you know, it takes two to tango. But I, one thing I will say, I don't think Rick Pitino is afraid. And I think Rick Pitino is trying to make St. John's one of the biggest brands in college basketball. And um, I, I listen, I think he's trying to make St. John's one of the biggest brands in college basketball. And, um, and I think playing at Rupp Arena, there, there is no more bigger stage in college basketball. You play at Madison Square Garden one year, Rupp Arena one year. Rick Pitino, the legend against his former player. Kentucky, the huge brand. Kentucky going to Madison Square Garden. Um, I think it's on Rick Pitino. It sounds like Mick, Mark, Mark Pope ain't ducking from it. I would also say, too, like, like we got to figure out some scheduling stuff going forward because you got the Champions Classic, you got Duke this year, you got CBS Sports Classic, you got this six-year deal with Gonzaga, you also have um, you also have the Indiana series starts up again. I don't know if it's next year or the year after. You got a lot on your plate, but if they're smart, I would say for sure there's no doubt that that's a direction to go. Great question from Andy. Ian asks, "Who do we know who UK plays in the CBS Sports Classic this year?" We don't. The CBS Sports Classic is the early December event. 
that features UCLA, North Carolina, and Ohio State. Who did Kentucky play this year? They played North Carolina this year. They beat North Carolina this year. That was a great game. I'll be honest. I don't know if Mark Pope has any say over this. That event feels like it's run its course, okay? It's right before Christmas. You know, UCLA doesn't travel. Ohio State doesn't travel. And so really when you don't get North Carolina versus Kentucky, like it feels like it's lost its juice. I, I've said for years, yeah. Champions Classic is great. It opens the college basketball season, essentially. It's the first big event of the college basketball season. Keep that. CBS Sports Classic, one of two things. I've said bring it to home environments. Play it one year at the Dean Dome. Play it one year at Pauley Pavilion. Play it one year at, at you know Ohio State. Play it one year at Rupp. I don't love the current setup of it, though. Again, that's that early, de mid-December. It's usually the weekend before Christmas. It's tough to get people to travel. does feel like that event's lost its juice. If I was Kentucky, let, let's cancel that thing. Let's get Indiana on that weekend. Let's get St. John's on that weekend. You can help CBS by getting Kentucky in a marquee game there. I, I think that event's run lost its juice, though. That was a question, great question from Ian. Torres, thank you for calling out Cal in the SEC tournament. Listen, so I'm not as anti-Calipari as most people. I do think the entire Calipari era ran its course. Listen, Kentucky fans, unpopular opinion. I think he's going to be good at Arkansas. I still think he's got to look. Listen, I said this on a, on a radio interview. I don't think he's throwing 98 on the black, you know, to use a baseball analogy, on the blacks of the home plate like he was probably in 2010, 2011. I still think he's hitting 91, 92 on the radar gun, though. And I think the fresh start is going to be good for him, but I think the fresh start is going to be good for Kentucky as well. But I only bring that up to say that even if I still think he has juice left in the tank, there are some things that I do think he just whiffed on. And listen, if you listen to our post-game show, I vividly remember, I was with producer Matt at Stadium Swim in Vegas. And Kentucky just comes out and just looks completely disinterested against Texas A&M. And I said, if I was a Kentucky fan that spent thousands of dollars, my year's uh, vacation to go to the SEC tournament, it's one thing if you lose. There are good teams in the SEC. But they came out flat and disinterested. And I do think Mark Pope, being a former player, he knows what that tournament means to that fan base. That, that's one thing that I think Cal was wrong on. I think, really, in my opinion, I don't even have a problem with the one-and-done stuff because I think it mostly worked for Cal. But the two things that I think Cal was wrong on, the SEC tournament and I think the early MTE tournaments, it just feels like Kentucky under Cal would play that Champions Classic game, and then you wouldn't hear from them for a month. And it's like, I get it. You can't play everybody every year. But you'd basically go from November 11th until basically the middle of December for that CBS Sports Classic, and all these programs are playing marquee games. They're going to the Maui Invitational, Battle for Atlantis, Home and Homes, this and that. And Kentucky's playing, you know, Penn and whoever and Eastern Washington, and I'm making schools up. Never like that from Cal. And listen, no, I'm never going to agree with everybody, everything from one person. And so I think Kentucky fans have the right – to be mad about that. Let's get a few more. And I do want to talk a little bit portal because portal was popping this weekend. Congratulations to sister Torres and the Torres family. Thank you. Yes. So, um, as I was getting ready, thank you, Kimmy cat, who says, congratulations, uncle Aaron. So literally as we were logging on to do the show, found out that my little sister just gave birth to a boy, um, out of her privacy, out of my, my brother-in-law's privacy, out of my new nephew's privacy. I'll spare many of the details, uh, but we won't share too many details, but we were expecting it last night. It didn't come. And so of course it came 30 seconds before I came on air. So I opened up my phone just to check on a few things. Um, and, uh, and there were pictures of my new nephew. So, uh, can't wait to spoil him. Um, you know, I'll make sure that he subscribes to the pod. Um, you know, can't wait to tell him about the Mark Pope era. Listen, this kid lives in a world where he knows nothing but the Mark Pope era. That's kind of crazy to think about, you know, he's going he's gonna to be reading about the Calipari era in history books. They'll be teaching him about it in history class when he's in school. But I uh, congrats to my sister on her, uh, on her firstborn. It is her firstborn. Just subbed and like Jason, truly appreciate your support. Listen, numbers, this, this. Literally, so I put this out. Um, thank you, Bernard, our bearded Clovis, who says you do a stellar job, Taurus. Let me say this. Last week was record setting, okay? I put out a tweet, but 
we did four largest live streams ever last week. Three of the four most viewed basketball videos ever were last week. Um, the law, the, the, the most viewed 48 hour window on this channel was last week. And so for us to do it in the basketball off season was absolutely incredible. Football numbers are always huge. Listen, for people who, who are new to me, I do talk college football as well. Obviously right now is college hoops, but football numbers are always going to be huge. The, uh, the support the last week is a credit to big blue nation. Listen, BBN, you don't want to hear it. It's a credit to Arkansas fans who are very passionate and excited about their new era credit to UConn fans who have chimed in as well. Um, but yeah, this week has been incredible. And here's the thing. We ain't slowing down. Like I'll be honest. I'm just going to be blunt. I think there's a lot of people who cover college basketball that thinks that, Oh, final four, we got a national champion. We'll do one show a week. No, 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 no. We're covering the portal, which we're going to get into in a minute. And on top of covering the portal, we are also going to be covering recruit. Like again, Kentucky has 11 scholarships to fill. Some of them are going to be guys maybe already in the program. Some of them may be guys that are already committed. But they have 11 scholarships to fill. Arkansas has 11 scholarships to fill. We got work to do. We ain't slowing down anytime soon. I did book a trip for Memorial Day. So I'm wondering if by Memorial Day, maybe some, some of this roster stuff is set. But we are not slowing down anytime soon. Maybe one more question, then I do want to get to some portal stuff. We Okay. If we don't have any, we could get back to it later. For producer, any UConn transfer updates? All right. So, Jacob, we are going to switch gears and talk portal. Before we do, producer Matt, one more time, show them the new merch in the Aaron Torres Media Store as we transition out of the Mark Pope conversation. That is right, baby. Do you have hope in Pope? Because Torres has hope in Pope. That is our new Kentucky merch Hope and Pope, get yours. The link is in the ticker if you're watching on YouTube. Oh, by the way, the link is on uh, is on YouTube as well. And guess what? Here's the other thing. It is at AaronTorresOnline.com slash merchandise. AaronTorresOnline.com slash merchandise. I'll be blunt. We actually sold a crap ton during this show, and that's the support of the Big Blue Nation. And like I said, listen, you know, I, I, I never tell anybody how to spend their money, okay? We all work hard. All I will tell you is everybody always asks me, Torres, how can I support the show? What can I do? What can I do to support you? You give us thousands of hours of free content every year. You've given us like seven live streams that have gone two or three hours every day last week. What can I do to support? You want to support? Get your Hope and Pope t-shirt, baby, courtesy of Aaron Torres Media. All right, let's go ahead and switch gears. And I do want to do a couple things. One the UConn National Championship Parade was on Saturday. I just want to spend a minute on that, and I want to get to the portal updates because there was two interesting things from the UConn Championship Parade. The first thing, Dan Hurley said, and I think this is important, Dan Hurley at the National Championship Parade said the following. He said that, guys, girls, UConn is the only college that I will ever coach at. Okay. So UConn had its championship parade. And one of the big things that Dan Hurley said was that UConn is the only college that I will ever coach at. Okay. And so this is obviously important on the heels of last week's run by Kentucky at Dan Hurley. Uh, we can argue debate. Was it ever serious? Was it not serious? Whatever. Only a handful of people know. But at the same time, I did think when Dan Hurley never really, in my opinion, seriously considered Kentucky, what that told me was that there isn't another college basketball job out there for him, okay? And so there isn't another college basketball job out there for him, and I believe this means that he is essentially a UConn basketball lifer. Now, if you talk to people close to him, the one thing I will say, if he continues to have success, and I still think, as weird as it sounds, I still think that he's kind of in the building phase I know it's impossible, right? You just won back-to-back -back national championships. But I think now there's a doubt. You're going to lose four starters. Donovan Klingon's already declared. And I do think there was there, there is some doubt about like, okay, can you really maintain it at that level? And so I love the fact that he was talking about going for a three-peat. Uh, I love the fact that he was talking about going for a three-peat during the parade. But I just bring it up for this very simple reason is that I still think he believes that he is in the building process. 
And I don't think he loves the portal. That was part of the reason why I never thought Kentucky made sense. Why are you going to go to a place that you need to replace 11 or 12 players when all you've been doing is saying how much you hate the portal? But two, I do think there is part of him that probably someday wants to potentially test himself in the NBA. Now, we'll see how it all works. I think there's a, a number of factors that would go into that. Um, one, by the way, I don't think it's any NBA job, okay? I don't think he's taking the Memphis Grizzlies job a year from now or the Los Angeles Clippers, or the Minnesota Timberwolves. And I know the Timberwolves are good this year, but you get the point. To me, I do think if it's an opportunity to coach the Knicks probably and to potentially be the guy to bring the Knicks back to the glory of the 70s that basically none of us have lived to see, I do think that's something that would intrigue him. But I did find it very interesting that he did say, I don't plan on, I will never pursue another college opening. But again, just to reiterate, if he wasn't going to go to Kentucky when Kentucky was ready to make him potentially, if you believe the reports, the highest paid coach in college sports. I mean, if if the number that Matt Jones put out there was correct, he was going to be the highest paid coach in college sports. It was like twelve and a half million a year, more than Kirby Smart, more than Dabo Sweeney, more than Brian Kelly, more than Lincoln Riley. But I believe he's a UConn guy. I believe if the right NBA opportunity presents itself at the right time, he could go. And UConn fans, if, if if you, if we, I include myself, lose him to his dream, other dream job in the NBA, I don't think we can really get mad at it. But I thought that was really important. I think, listen, every time one of these big job opens, if Duke somehow opens or Carolina somehow opens or Kentucky opens in a couple years, his name will be involved. I don't believe that he will consider going there. Really quickly, other big takeaway. By the way, we will have uh, Hassan Diara one more time on this week, I can't wait to talk to him, um, and I, I'm really excited because I, you know, he he's got a very interesting decision to make as well. But when you start to look ahead to UConn next year, I found this particularly interesting. So UConn, as I said, is almost certainly going to lose four starters off last year's team. Uh, they're going to lose Donovan Klingon, who's already declared. Steph Castle will declare some point in the future. Uh, Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer are out of eligibility. Well, the fifth starter, Alex Caravan, was really good last year. And I think there was a belief like this might be his last year, the 2023-2024 season. Didn't quite go to plan. He had a, some injuries. He was a little bit banged up. This, that, the other thing. Well, I bring it up because he was asked about potentially returning for another year of college basketball at the parade. This is from Evan Rodriguez. Uh, this was a tweet from Evan Rodriguez, who is an intern journalist with the Daily Campus, the UConn student newspaper. So credit to Evan for getting a great quote. Here's what Alex Caravan said about potentially returning. He said, to go for a three-peat, that's obviously a huge bonus. Coming back, it would mean everything to me. I'd be able to graduate. I've been taking a lot of classes, and I'd be able to graduate in my third year. There's a lot of plus to coming back, and coaches are in full support of that too if I decide to do that. I love this program so much. I think that's just the main thing, too. Coming back, I'd be able to put on a UConn jersey again. Well, let me say this. I will never begrudge any player from doing what they think is best for them. It is not my place to say. It is not my place to tell somebody what's best for them. What I will tell you, that does not sound like a player who plans on going pro after this year. And I thought it kind of made sense for him to go pro. He'll probably be a second rounder. You know, do you come back? Whatever. But I think he brings up a, a few interesting points. One, he actually redshirted during the 2020-2021 COVID season when they were playing in front of empty, fan, uh, empty stands, came in in December. So he's on track to graduate after next season. And so I look at the situation. He was good this year, but not great. And had some injuries. And obviously, look, he took a backseat like any great teammate does. Donovan Klingon emerged late. Steph Castle emerged late. Tristan Newton was an All-American. And so I could see him saying, like, look, I can come back next year. I'll probably be the star. You look at some of the guys that should return. Jalen Stewart, a freshman who was very good this year. Solo Ball, who was very good this year. A couple nice freshmen coming in. Ahmad Noel potentially recruiting a couple big names out of the portal, potentially recruiting Liam McNeely, the McDonald's All-American who is available. But I can come in and be the star. It'll be about me. 
And it's kind of what we talked about a little while ago with DJ Wagner and Reed Shepard and all that. If you come back, you get to be the face of the program. You get to improve your draft stock. You get to go from maybe a second round guy that gets drafted somewhere to maybe a top 15 guy. If you average 19, 20 points a game at UConn, you're a guy that's going to go early in the NBA draft. So those were the two big takeaways for me. UConn gets its second straight national championship. Bluntly, listen, I think Dan Hurley, I don't want to say he's a UConn lifer because I do think, listen, knock on wood, if you're a UConn fan, I mean, listen, if he, if he stays 10 more years and gets one more national championship, that's still a success. Now, the standard he set is insanely high. But if he stays another four, five, six years, maybe gets another national championship, maybe two more Final Fours, and then he just says, you know what? I'm in my mid to late 50s at this point. My kids are out of the house. I want to go try and be the Knicks coach. It's hard for me to blame him if he decides that, but thought it was interesting that he basically said, listen, you know, I, he didn't say Kentucky specifically, but he basically insinuated there's no job out there. And I and I believe that. I don't believe that there's um, – I, Kentucky would have been the only one. You're not going to UCLA, not, definitely not built for Duke. Um, and there's I don't think there's any other one out there outside of Kentucky that would really appeal to him. Water under the bridge now because guess what? He is officially staying at UConn for the foreseeable future. As he said, um, he doesn't plan on going anywhere. All right, what I want to do now, do want to go ahead and wrap with the portal. By the way, I see Clinton in the chat saying, I love the Mark Pope shirt. Uh, appreciate it. We got a few more orders just in the last couple minutes. UK fans, listen, your old coach used to say it. You people are crazy. Thank you for the support. Truly appreciate it. All that good stuff. Uh, hope and Pope. I don't even think we need hope, but we got it. Appreciate everybody for your support. Again, the link is right there. That is our newest. AT Media shirt. Thank you to our uh, to our guy who uh, Aiden who does all of our designs. Who is a UK fan? By the way, I'll tell you this: when I told Aiden, "Hey, we need a new shirt design. It's a Mark Pope shirt." Oh, buddy, did he get excited to do this one? So, Hope and Pope, the link is right there. As I've said a couple times, if you want to support the show, don't ask for much, um, but we can get you one of those shirts for sure. All right, do want to go ahead and wrap? So, we've done a lot of of portal updates. Uh, we've done a lot of portal updates uh, on YouTube. Haven't done very many on the pod, but think now is probably the right time to start really diving into it, right? And sometimes the portal update doesn't work when we're talking about a coaching change or a national championship, Final Four preview, whatever. But this felt like the weekend. Like, okay, we got a lot of dudes in the portal. Guys are making visits. Guys are starting to commit. So what I want to do, is take about four or five minutes to talk about some of the big players that entered the portal and some of the big players that have since either committed or set up visits or whatever. Because listen, April is a big part of the college basketball calendar. It is the time of year where rosters are built, rosters are put together. Let's talk about some of the big portal news and notes from the course of this weekend. First of all, let's talk about some of the players that have entered. Now, admittedly, some of these guys kind of overlap with the conversation about Mark Pope coming to Kentucky, um, but not everybody will have watched that part. Some are coming in for the portal stuff. So I want to talk about the players that have entered the portal over the last couple of days. And I think the big one to start with, uh, Zvonavir Ivisic, Big Z from the University of Kentucky. So if you're just looking at a stat sheet on Big Z, um, it goes without saying like, you know, it, stats don't blow you away, okay? He averaged five and a half points, three and a half boards, and 1.3 blocks in just 11 minutes per game. But any Kentucky fan is here to tell you that dude's a baller and he got really good as time went on. Now, first of all, why were the stats so low? Keep in mind, he didn't even get admitted to school until like September, October. Comes late, then he's not eligible. He did not play. He only played a, a total of 15 games, did not play in any games until that Georgia game in late January, okay? So it was hard figuring out how to implement him, how to get him involved, this and that. Obviously, the Georgia game was probably the best game he played, 13 points, 5 of 7 from the field, 3 of 4, 3-point shooting. But I'm here to tell you, this kid is a really talented player, and I think what stands out to me is that he's really good on both ends of the floor. Now, he got a, you know sometimes it was a little physical for him, sometimes he was a step slow, but he's so big, seven foot one, seven foot two, so athletic. 
And the ability to block shots, in my opinion, was a game changer. Had four block shots in the win over Alabama, three in that big win against Mississippi State, three in that SEC tournament loss to Texas A&M. And the big question is, what does Big Z decide to do? The obvious answer, by the way, we're recording here Sunday at about 8 p.m. Eastern time. So if this is old news by the time you listen, don't yell at Torres. Don't be mad at Torres. I am just telling you in real time what is going on, okay? Um, and so I bring it up because Big Z, in my opinion, uh, producer Matt, I love the graphic there. Thank you so much. He is, of course, that seven-foot kid who played at Kentucky. Um, Big Z, in my opinion, listen, you'd have to think that Arkansas is the favorite, right? Um, and Kentucky fans, I know you're going to be mad. I know you're going to get whatever. But at the end of the day, listen, Calipari brought him over. Calipari fought for him. Calipari went to war for him, and he is probably pretty loyal to John Calipari. Now, I will say, if I'm Mark Pope, right along Reed Shepard and right along DJ Wagner, that is a guy that you have to go after if you're Mark Pope. You have to make this kid feel wanted. You have to show him what you can do for him in your system. And so I'll be fascinated to see, listen, I, I could be wrong. I have no super intel on this one, but this doesn't strike me as the kind of kid that's going to, you know, going to take a visit to Washington or take a visit to Texas or take a visit to Yukon. Like, I think it's, it's going to be either Arkansas or a return to Kentucky or potentially a return overseas. My guess is it's Arkansas early. And if he decides to go, I just think it's a loyalty to Calipari. You can like it. You cannot like it. I just think that's a reality. A couple other interesting names that enter the portal. Listen, I, I think we got to talk when we talk about interesting names that enter the portal this weekend. Um, I think we got to talk about some of the guys that entered from Mark Pope's team at BYU. Dallin Hall, we talked about during the Mark Pope segment. Really good college basketball player. Now, he's young. He's only a sophomore. Uh, played the last two years at BYU. Averaged nine points, five assists, and 36% from the three-point line. Found it very interesting that essentially Friday morning, the second that Mark Pope uh, announced that he was leaving or that it was reported that he was leaving, I don't even know if it was official at that point. At that point, um, Mark Pope, uh, this kid entered the portal. And so you'd have to think that that kid is probably going to follow Mark Pope. And you talk about just a great piece to start out with if you're the Kentucky Wildcats. Nine points per game, as I said, five assists per game. Um, not a point guard, but can pass, dribble, cut, shoot, whatever. Um, and just a guy that I think would really be embraced by that fan base. Smart, high IQ basketball player. Um, he did enter the portal right after Mark Pope decided to leave. And so my guess would be, that that Kentucky is probably the favorite to land him. Thought it was interesting. Ali Khalifa, who of course um, follow uh, was also another player that played for Mark Pope at BYU, entered the portal a few hours after Mark Pope left. Now we talked about Ali Khalifa a minute ago. This is not a guy to bring in to play 36 minutes a night in the SEC, okay? But just because you're not a starter doesn't mean that you don't have insane value and he's a kid that, in my opinion, listen, again, if you're bringing him in to play 18 to 20 minutes as the backup center in a system that he is comfortable in, in a system that he thrived in, he's got a chance to be really good for the Kentucky Wildcats next year if he decides to come. Average five and a half points per game, four assists per game in just 19 minutes of game action, okay? So you talk about a guy average four assists in under 20 minutes of play, not great at math, but that extrapolates out to an eight assists per 40 minutes uh, uh, ratio if you extrapolate it out to 40 minutes. Big kid, um, you know, not a great athlete, but just a great passer. Um, you know, he has fouls to give in the paint, and I think he would be a fan favorite at Kentucky if he ends up going. Uh, again, dime dropper, bucket getter, uh, puts guys in position to succeed. Great, great, great passer. So we'll see what happens from there. A couple visits happened this weekend that I think are at least worth discussing very quickly. Jacob Petruzzi asked for any UConn updates. Well, as of 8 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, unless I missed something, there is no official word on this, but UConn did have a visitor this weekend, Terrace Reed Jr., the center from the University of Michigan, okay? 
Terrace Reed Jr., center from the University of Michigan this past season, he did average about nine points per game, seven and a half boards per game, 1.4 blocks per game as well. So UConn obviously is going to need a big man. Donovan Klingon is gone. And I'll be curious, you know, obviously Dan Hurley probably won't have any media availability anytime soon, but I'd be curious how Dan Hurley views this kid. Do, does UConn plan to keep Samson Johnson coming off the bench? Samson Johnson, of course, was the big guy, the backup to Donovan Klingon. Are they recruiting a starting center? Are they recruiting a backup to Samson Johnson? Or are they telling Samson Johnson, hey, you're six foot ten, dude, but you're super athletic. Let's work on some of your perimeter skills and let's make you a four five man that can play both. Either way, Terrace Reed, listen, I don't think he's like super, like the best player that's ever entered the portal, but you average nine and seven in the Big Ten, you're doing something right. He had some very big games, especially late in the year, 12 and eight in the final game of the season for Michigan, where they had, uh, where they lost to Penn State in the Big Ten tournament. Big kid, not super athletic, but he's tough. He's physical, kind of guy that you need in the Big East. You're obviously never going to find a Donovan Klingon replacement. But I'd be fascinated to see, like, is this dude a real like? Like, is are are, are we are, are we bringing him in if we're UConn to start him? Are we bringing him in to back up Samson Johnson? Is it going to be a two headed monster? Thing that'll be really interesting on Terrace Reed. Remember, he was visiting this weekend, which means that he attended a national championship parade as a member of the uh, you know as a as a as an official visitor to UConn. UConn probably has about three spots to fill, fill via the portal. One is clearly a big guy, and he is clearly a priority. A couple other visits from this weekend. Well, really just one more that stood out. Um, Cade Tyson, one of the best three-point shooters in college basketball, visited Tennessee this weekend and will visit North Carolina next week. And he played at Belmont, 16 points per game, 46% from three. As I record, he has not committed. We'll see if anything changes. But thing that stands out to, about him Again, he was only a sophomore, six foot seven. His brother Hunter Tyson actually plays in the NBA, but elite three point shooter. And what I was thinking about with, with with this with this kid is, you know, Rick Barnes pursuing him. One does feel like a Dalton Connect, uh, you know, replacement. But two, I do wonder how much Rick Barnes enjoyed having that dude that could just go get buckets. Right, almost reminded me of the Dan Hurley situation, where Dan Hurley. Um, you know, until about two, three years ago, he emphasized toughness and rebounding and defense and this and that. And then about two off seasons ago, he emphasized, um, scoring. And he said, you know what? We could play tough defense and also score. And I wonder if Rick Barnes was like, you know what? It's nice not having to win every game 62 to 58. So Kay Tyson is a name to know. He visits Carolina next weekend. You know, it's interesting. Carolina has been pretty quiet on the portal front. They have a really good uh, freshman class coming in with uh, with Ian Jackson and with Drake Powell. I suspect the Elliott Cadeaus, the Jalen Washingtons will be back, so they don't need a ton necessarily, but Kate Tyson would be great for them, and it appears as though he's visiting. Really quickly, a couple commits before we get out of here. The one that stood out from the weekend. How about my boy Mike Effin Woodson? Mike Effin Woodson. Mike Effin Woodson going out and getting what I believe to be one of the best guards in the transfer portal, Miles Rice, who just finished his freshman year at Washington State. And I use freshman year loosely because a very unique story on Miles Rice. He is actually a third year junior, uh, third year freshman, excuse me, in a very unique circumstance. Freshman year, he's from uh, the South. Goes out to Washington State, decides to redshirt in the 2021-2022 season. His sophomore year, this is the scary part, diagnosed with leukemia. Incredibly, makes a full recovery, you know, knock on wood, you know, God's blessings, all that. Um, healthy, comes back to basketball this year and ends up winning the Pac-12 Freshman of the Year this year. Average 14.8 points per game, 3.8 assists, almost two steals per game. He's a really good college basketball player. Okay, I don't know if he's an NBA player, but he's six foot three, ball in his hands, very comfortable, gets stuff set up. And the thing I'd say from the Indiana perspective, I think he's kind of the anti Xavier Johnson. Xavier Johnson was Indiana's point guard the last few years, and there was a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Xavier Johnson was like this elite plus 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 athlete, but there were moments where it's just like, what are you doing? Too many turnovers, too many bad shots, not a great shooter. 
If you're Xavier Johnson, not a knock, just a reality. This guy's kind of the exact opposite. Smart, heady, doesn't beat himself. Smart system. Remember, he played for Kyle Smith, who's a great coach now at Stanford. This is a big recruiting win for Indiana. Now, the one knock, I will readily admit, Indiana was one of the worst three-point shooting teams this past year. 27% three-point shooter. He was not great. But the one thing I'll say, listen, I'm not a, a um, an expert on, you know, shooting form and all that. I mean, I know what I know, but I'm not a, you know, a, 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 a workout guru or anything. He, he, he had a shot where it wasn't like crooked. It wasn't like Lonzo Ball didn't know what he was doing. Like, no, nah. he, he, he can shoot the ball. He just didn't shoot it that well this year. I think he's going to be really good. What will be interesting from the Indiana perspective, there are two other kids right now that are really good players that are both projected to be potential Indiana commits. Cannon Carlisle, true freshman last year at, at, at Stanford. Um, he had a wild story. So he played, um, he played this past year at Stanford. Stanford's admissions is just insane. So I, I, I kind of knew somebody that was at Stanford that was with him. And first of all, they believe this kid's an NBA player. So he did not play until he did not play for Stanford this year until the middle of December. And what was crazy about it was he got admitted to school. He got like a C in summer school and the school themselves pulled him out of competition. Basically said, we need you to prove that you can focus on the academics. That's how crazy things are at Stanford. He comes back as a true freshman in the Pac-12, averages 11 and a half points per game. He had one game, by the way, early on. He went for 28 against Arizona, six of eight from three. Not a great three-point shooter like Miles Rice. But if you can get him, that is an NBA-level type talent, okay? That is an NBA-level type talent in Cannon Carlisle. And if Indiana gets him, I'm here to tell you, listen, they'll be a little bit small. They won't be perfect, not great. Three, those are two all Big Ten kind of guys. If you can get Cannon Carlisle, Miles Rice committed. Oh, by the way, Umar Balo, the center from Arizona, is also reportedly leaning towards Indiana. May take a few visits. Again, this is all in the moment. Um, but you get those three. That is a heck of a start to next year's team. Keep in mind, they also have Mackenzie and Baco. Finally, really quickly, uh, producer Matt just dropped this in my notes here. Um, Tremont Mark leaving Arkansas to go to Texas. So Tremont Mark played a couple years at Houston, was really good at Houston. Goes to Arkansas this year, averages 16 points per game. He was probably their most consistent player, but he has decided to return home to Texas. Big win for Texas. Listen, you know, one thing I thought Texas lacked this past year was really size at the guard position. Had Max Azemus, had Tyrese Hunter, two smaller guys. Um, and you needed size at that position. You get size at that position in Tremont Mark. Now, he was inconsistent, up and down, had some injury stuff, but really good player. I mean, I'm talking about one of the best big guards in college basketball. He's got winning experience, went to Houston, had success there. And listen, I don't blame him. Coach Cal is starting new. Coach Cal is probably going to bring in some freshmen. And at this point, you know, he's deciding to fresh start to start fresh over as well. I think he has a chance to be an all, I guess he'd be an all SEC type player. Cause remember Texas is going to the big 12 next year or going from the big 12 to the SEC, but Tremon Mark, the other name that you need to know in the portal. All right. Uh, very quickly, producer, Matt. any other interesting questions before we get out of here? We've been live for over an hour. Listen, when, when Torres just lets loose and answers questions, these shows go long. So I appreciate everybody who's tuning in. HDNW says, Torres is one of the best to do it. Listen, we try, man. We try to have fun. We try to be informative. We try to be knowledgeable. But we try to we try to have fun, basically, is the bottom line. Um, so thank you to HDNW. High def in the northwest part of the country, apparently. Thank you guys for your support. You know, we, we just try to have fun. We try to work hard, all that good stuff. Anything else before we get out of here? A lot of just shenanigans in the um, a lot of shenanigans in the uh, in the chat. So I'll tell you what. Listen, we are going to get out of here on a couple notes. One, first off, producer Matt. One more time. I hate to be a shill, but 
Do you have hope in Pope? Because Torres has hope in Pope. That is right. Our newest Aaron Torres merch. We got it available for the press conference today. Go to AaronTorresOnline.com slash merchandise. The link will be in the show description on YouTube. The link will be in the show description on Apple and Spotify. These are our newest merch. Love it. We appreciate Mark Pope. We appreciate BBN. Again, again, you want to know how you can support the show? This is the way to do it. With that said, uh, we will get out of here. I want to appreciate. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining tonight's Aaron Torres Pod live reaction to a busy night for Mark Pope. If you're not subscribed to the show, please make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, but also if you're not subscribed on YouTube, make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Make sure to put on that notifications button so you know when we go live. Because here's the thing. Kentucky's got like 11 players to sign over the next couple weeks. Arkansas has got a bunch. UConn's got a bunch. We're going to be reacting to it all. By the way, Monday we will have Hassan Diara. Monday night, Hassan Diara will join us. Final time this season coming off a second straight national championship. We always appreciate Hassan Diara's support. If you're not subscribed to the show, make sure to do so. Also, make sure to follow on social media. Aaron underscore Torres on Twitter. Aaron Torres pod on Instagram. The Instagram page was a little bit humming this week. I'm very uh, happy with that. Uh, we are ramping up our TikTok page. Uh, Aaron Torres pod on TikTok as well. All for today's show. I'm going to get out of here. That Mark Pope press conference was electric. Shout out to Torrent Craig. By the way, one more note. B99 says Torres is the best sports podcast. We appreciate your support as well. Going to get out of here. Grateful for your support. That's all for today's show. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F-head. Unblock me, bro. By the way, I saw my buddy Kyle Tucker, who also has me blocked at the Mark Pope press conference. That's all for today's show. Appreciate your support. We will see you, Hassan Diara, on Monday. Couple updates throughout the day. Also, probably a next full show, probably on Tuesday night. We will see you soon, party people. We appreciate 